You could say our discussion so far has been pretty empty, but let's look at a way of introducing a set that has exactly one thing in it. So I'll start in blue writing the syntax. If you take a term and you put some curly braces around it like this, then overall you will get a term. So take any term, you can put curly braces around it and you'll get a term. Well, that means if you want to, you can keep putting curly braces. You know, I can start with X, that's a term. Or how about the empty set? That's a term. Now, since it's a constant, it's a term. I can put curly braces around it, and that will be a term. I can put curly braces around that, and that will be a term. And so on. Or I can take anything and then start chaining curly braces on and creating more and more complicated terms. Okay, so that's just grammar. It's not telling you the meaning. The idea is that when you write this, it's supposed to be you know, instead of writing a bunch of words, how, how about just it's a bag thinking of a set as a, as a bag, and it just has this one thing in it, and that thing is called x. That's it. That's, that's the idea. And formalism the definition. Definition, hang on, 16. <clears throat> so this is a definition, so here's the new notation. It's a term, so I'm writing an equal sign here. And it's defined to be, and now I'm going to write down something that is already defined. So something that already has meaning. And what goes here is, it's a set of uh, y, such that y equals x. So that's the set of things that are equal to x. Or in other words, the set of things that are x. So uh, the, way, the way I think about this notation, like any Anytime you see this kind of notation, let me use y since I'm using that here. Anytime you see this kind of notation, um, this is a term, right? And it's meant to refer to the set of y such that phi holds. Anytime I see this kind of notation, I think of it like a club. Um, and the bouncer of the club is this proposition. And anytime someone comes in and says they want to get into the club, like say A here says, hey, can I get in? Is this true? Is A in here? Then the bouncer, phi, says, well, I don't know. Let me try putting you in for Y and seeing if this is true. So this would, so phi is the membership condition. Phi is club membership condition. If this is true, then A is in there. If it's not true, then A doesn't get to come in. So that's, uh, a way of thinking about it. So what I've written down here is a club whose membership condition is being x, being equal to x. In other words, being x. To get into this club, you must be x. So in other words, this club has just one uh, lone guy in there, and that's x itself. The notation has a name. Uh, this is called a singleton. So we read, when you're writing this or trying to read it in English, you can call it singleton x, the singleton of x, or a singleton set consisting of only x. Usually, I'll quickly just say singleton x to refer to this. Um, one thing that I've heard people say uh, incorrectly is they'll say the set x. That doesn't sound right. I wouldn't call this the set x. Uh, I mean, x is, when you say the set x, it sounds like you're referring to a set, and that set is x. Right? Uh, I, I get why people are saying this. Sometimes people are saying this just to say, using the word the set to refer to the curly braces, and then x to refer to what's inside. But when you say the set x, it sounds like you're referring to a, a set, which is called x. and 
everything is a set, so x is a set, but that's not what you're referring to. You're not referring to x. You're trying to refer to curly braces x, curly brace. Okay, so that's pretty good. Uh, how about a set that has two things in it? So let's say I wanted to define definition uh, 17. Let's say I wanted to define this notation, a set that has two things in it. And I would regret using y up here. How about I change it up and use uh, p. I don't know, just a letter that's not going inter to interfere with anything. So this is the set of things that equals x. Now, how about I define this? So I guess first I should describe the, the grammar. It'll be curly braces, comma, and then in between here and here you can put a term, and here you can put another term, and overall you'll get a term here. This will be a term in the end. And we want to think of it as kind of a bag that has two things in it, x and y, if we write x comma y like this. So how can we define this? Well, our way of defining sets is by describing a condition for membership. What is the condition for membership? Uh, if someone wants to get into this club, what do they have to do? Well, they have to either be X or be Y. That's the condition for membership. You must either be X or you must be Y. And we have a, sim we have a logic symbol for or. Um, so we can write this as words or the logic symbol. But that's the condition for membership. Either be x or be y. And um, this construction has a particular name, singleton. I don't think this one has an official name, um, but I usually just call it doubleton, since that just follows the pattern. So you might hear me call this doubleton, just so I can call it something. So this is a made up word, I think. I'm actually not certain. Maybe it's a real word. Doubleton XY is maybe what I would call this. Um, okay, maybe a more reasonable terminology would be to call it the set consisting of X and Y. So one thing you might notice about the way this is constructed um, is that since the condition for membership is that you just have to either be X or be Y, it feels like if you write y comma x, if you write it in a different order, that wouldn't be any different. It would still just be uh, a club where the bouncer just asks, are you either x or y? And if you're either one of them, then you get to go in, otherwise not. So this seems like the same thing. And in fact, it is. These are equal. And to prove their equality, you need to use the definition somehow. So this is a theorem which needs proof, and it is theorem 20. I'm kind of going through things out of order here, but that's that's okay. I'm not actually going to prove this one in, in the lecture. I, I would like you to study the, uh, the proofs as you go along, so please study the proof of this one. But I'm just pointing it out that this is things like this are the reason I'm using bags in my pictures, or like a sack of elements in my pictures, rather than writing things down as an ordered list. So while the notation looks like an ordered list, right, this looks like x comes first and then y comes second, there's no order really there. Uh, there's only an order in the notation because we write from left to right, and I have to choose to write one of them first and then the other one second. But it doesn't matter which one you write first or second, you're constructing the same set with this notation. So lesson... Uh, make sure when you're imagining sets that you imagine them as disordered piles of, of points or elements. All right, now I want to go through this theorem together, theorem 19. And uh, I want to do it uh, in video just because it's sort of a, a fun theorem that combines the different things we've learned about membership, inclusion, and the singleton construction. All right, so this says 
x is an element of s if and only if singleton x is a subset of x of s. So uh, before I start the proof, actually, let me show you uh, what I imagine in pictures when I think about this. So I imagine that s is some bag. Everything is a bag in the end because everything is a set, right? Um, but some things I'd rather write as dots because I'm never going to look at what's inside them. Um, so x I'm going to write as a dot. So the left side situation, x is in s, I think of like this. So this is how I imagine x is in s. Then I'm saying that's equivalent to, in this theorem we're saying that's equivalent to this situation on the right side, which is a subset statement where I've got this bag s, and I don't know what's in there maybe, and I'm saying if I take a bag that has only x in it, so it's a little bag, it only has x in it. So here s might have other stuff like y, z, um, then that's a subset of s. Remember how inclusion works? It says that every element of this thing is an element of this thing. So if you were to open this bag and t look at any particular thing, then you would find a copy of that thing over here inside this bag. So I hope that's uh, kind of intuitive that, that this theorem is true. On the left side, you're saying, if you were to open this bag, then you would find an X in there. On the right side, we're saying, for any given thing that you would find inside the left-hand bag, so there's only one thing to consider, uh, that thing, you can find a copy of that thing over in the right-hand bag. Now, um, okay, so in the in the pictures, like on the left side, it looks like there's there's X in there in S, and on the right side, it looks like X is not in S, but maybe there's a copy of it in S. So what's going on with with the word copy? There's there's nothing about copying going on. I'm only using the word copy to make the picture feel better. Uh, in the end, uh, I mean, you can imagine whatever help, helps you. And I, I like to imagine things like this. In the end, maybe a better thing to imagine would be that there's just one thing called X. And there are some sets that it is in and some sets that it is not in. And in both pictures, it is in S. Okay, enough pictures. So proof, this is an if and only if statement. So it's a double arrow. That means the proof will consist of two single arrows. So the proof consists of two parts. Uh, the right word implication requires me to assume that X is in S. Now I need to prove that singleton X is a subset of S. So let me create a little scratch work zone with my goals in it. My goal is to prove that singleton X is a subset of S. So that means my goal is to prove that for all Z, if Z is in singleton X, then Z is in S. Okay, so I need to do universal generalization. So then consider any Z in singleton X. And now my goal becomes prove that Z is in S. So this is what I have in mind. I want to prove Z is in S. Okay, what to do, what to do? Well, I don't have any like definition for S in the setup. S is just an arbitrary thing, right? So I don't think I can break my goal down any further. I cannot break down Z or S. So I think my goal is as far broken down as possible. So what I can break down maybe is this assumption. Z is in singleton X. Z is in singleton X means Z is in, and then let me write down the definition of singleton X. It's the set of P such that P equals X. Notice I chose a letter here that doesn't conflict with the Z here. So I'm just choosing letters that don't conflict. And I also chose P because I happened to choose that back here. But, you know, this could have been written with Z's, right? Then I would make sure I didn't use Z here just to avoid conflict. Uh, actually, it would be fine if there were Z's here. It's not a big deal. In fact, we even we even had that situation earlier, like here. It didn't 
cause any problems. Okay, so then z is in there, so by axiom, so you see what happened from here to here. That's using the definition of singleton, definition 16, and axiom 2. So I'm not going to break that down in so many details like I did last time, but that's, that's what's happening from there to there. And, in fact, uh, we can now use axiom 5 to get z is in the set, so z is in the set of things that equal x, therefore by axiom 5, z equals x. Therefore by axiom 5, z equals x. Okay, so I think I've fully made use of this fact now. I went from z is in singleton x to z equals x. What now? Well, my goal is to prove that z is an s. How does this help? Well, I have found out that z is x. Ah, and x is an s. Okay. So, since x is an s, this is another axiom too. Since x is an s, and x is z, z is an s. So that's it for that direction. Let me separate this out a little bit better. Great, and let me clear out my goal stack. Okay, so now assume, assume this side. So assume singleton x is a subset of s. Now my goal is to prove that x is in s. Okay, this one is a little bit trickier. So I have, okay, so this, this area is goals. In my scratch work, let me break down what I have. I have this, right? So that means I have that for all z, so this is a subset statement here. So I have that for all z, if z is in singleton x, then z is in s. That is what I have. So somehow I need to use that to prove that x is in s. How in the world do I use this to prove this? Well, look at this. Uh, this is a machine for proving that things are elements of S, right? If I apply this, if I use universal instantiation and apply this to a particular instance, to a particular Z, um, as long as that Z were something that's in singleton X, then this would be a way of proving that that Z is in S. I would like to prove that X is in S. So then I would like to use universal instantiation and apply this to the case where x is playing the role of z. So if I can prove that x is in singleton x, then I will be able to conclude that x is in s, which is my goal. Okay, you see how tricky it would have been to come up with that idea without writing down clearly what it is I have on some scratch paper. So I really recommend when you're writing proofs to have some scratch paper where you're uh, breaking things down and just trying things without being afraid of uh, affecting your final draft. Um, in fact, you're writing your proofs on in LaTeX usually, right? So uh, you definitely should have scratch paper. Okay, so the goal then becomes prove that x is in singleton x. So new goal x is in singleton x. That's now my goal. Okay, let me break down this goal using axiom 5. According to axiom 5, x is in singleton x. Well, first, using the definition of singleton, this is my goal. Prove that x is in the set of things that equal x. According to axiom 5, then, this is my goal. Prove that x equals x. Ah, but that's just... Axiom 1, right? Alright, just making a hard barrier here. 
uh, only these here are goals. This is what we have. Okay, so I can sort of go backwards up this chain of ideas. Now I know the correct next step to take. But that would have been very hard to know without doing some scratch work at first. So by axiom 1, x is x. Therefore, by axiom 5, x is in the set of things that are x. So by uh, the definition of singleton, whatever that was, definition 16, x is in singleton x. Now I can use this, uh, now I can use this, since x is in the left side, and the left side is a subset of the right side, I can use universal instantiation and apply this to the specific case where the, the role of z is played by x. So let me write that carefully. Since x is in singleton x and singleton x is a subset of s, x is in s. So that sentence there is a universal instantiation. It does not immediately look like one. You don't see the universal quantifier because it's hiding inside the definition of this. But it's there. There is a universal quantifier there. And that's it. That was the goal, uh, right? Yeah, that was the goal. Yeah, and for this arrow, I just needed to prove that x is an s. So that's it. And again, I'm not going to include any of this junk here in the actual proof. OK, so we just got done with theorem 19. And I'll have you read through theorem 20, study the proofs here, 21 on your own. And uh, I'll give you this one for homework. Theorem 22. So uh, a doubleton sometimes can equal a singleton, or a set consist that looks like it consists of two elements can it sometimes, in fact, only have one element. And that happens precisely when uh, the two things you listed are actually equal. So uh, try this, try your best, and if, if you're very stuck with it, um, wait until the next lecture. We can, we can do this one in lecture next time. And that, that'll give you some ideas, hopefully. This one is much more complicated, but it'll have a lot of the same ideas.